Hello and welcome to another episode of Simple Ken. I have the lovely Uncle Varaku. Thank you, Kenny. And now we play the intro song. So we're back from the intro song and uh, it, it's really nice to uh, finally meet you and talk to you. In person, yes. In person and uh, because we live in a content world, this is going to be recorded, our first interaction together. Uh, I think the first uh, interaction we had digitally was I had put a reel up about uh, what, wasting uh, time or life or something, <laughs> some parody on, <laughs> on something on and then you commented. <laughs> I think that was the first interaction we had. Yeah, I, yeah. I've, I've consumed a lot of your content. And oh, I've been a fan for a long time. Uncle, thank you for doing is, what you're doing. Thank you for saying that. It is a rule on podcast. We have to say you're each other's fan. That's a <laughs> big fan of the podcast. Big fan of you. That's the rule. You can't That's just be rule. like, I've seen your work. Yeah. And you can't stop like yeah, that. Yeah, you can't stop. Like, big yeah. fan. Big fan. Actually, I've seen, um, I think from the beginning, um, if I'm not wrong, you got into the content creation journey in during COVID or uh, slightly before that? Well, I, I blew up during COVID. Got it. But I've been creating content for nearly a decade now. Really? Yes. Oh, sorry. I didn't know that. And uh, so I saw you uh, during the blow up during COVID and I've been pretty much following. Um, uh, I've seen the when you should buy a car, which is never... <laughs> And um, saving for retirement, which I'm doing, uh, which also actually during COVID, I had that whole financial, uh, I need to know more about money uh, phase. And I'm so glad I did. Because uh, as an artist, you know, people yeah. kind of be like, I'm an artist. I don't know much about money. Uh, this is not my job. And I yeah. think uh, it was a wake up call to Thanks. you know the basics at least. Exactly. And um, and now, so you've, you've uh, written your third book. That's why... Uh, we have been arranged to meet. <laughs> uh, but I thought uh, before we get into all of that, uh, me and the few of the audiences who are mm. not aware of Uncle the Person. Okay. Uh, I'll ask you some stuff to get to know you. I know you're from Delhi. Sure. I know you're married. I know you have two lovely children. Yes. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I just know you that I know you had a company and you sold the company and then you wanted to uh, give back to the community what you've learned. But there's a lot of life before that. A <laughs> lot of life even... Uh, how, was, um, uh, how was Uncle the college kid? Uh, very nerdy. Yeah. Very studious. Uh, felt that the only way to make it in life was through education. Because that was what I was taught by my parents. And that was the only rule that I lived by. So the darling of the teacher's eyes. Never making any mistakes. Never getting into any trouble. Always judging those who are skipping classes always judging those who are your front bench <clears throat> yeah nearly okay. nearly yeah I, I i wasn't the one who would want to grab that seat but i was like yeah it's i don't implied. mind being I, 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 I wouldn't mind being in the front bench at all yeah um and very very stuck up oh. very stuck up very like judgmental af has, is that young at, as a college kid? Usually college kid is like the more hippie, like No, I was, cool, I was man. very stuck up, Kenny. I was so stuck up. I, was, I, was, I had these very set rules and principles. So I thought everyone who smokes and drinks is an evil person. I mean, that's true, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And not, not evil in the sense that they're doing something bad. They're evil people. Like oh. they're the ones who are going to go and blow the world up in the future. And, and I felt anyone who doesn't do well in studies is like a complete loser. Uh, anyone who's partying and, and, and chilling and wasting time and bunking classes and an absolute doofus. Oh my God. I, I'm, not, I'm not proud of who I was at that point. Is this like a upbringing thing? Like, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Very, very, very traditional, very conservative, very uh, straight lined. You, you study hard, you get a good job, you work hard, you get good increments and then you just you know, retire and that's your life and that'll be a happy life. Then you can drink? <laughs> Yeah, it, it, like you know, I was so convinced, Kenny, that this was the playbook that would work for me. That I did it for almost all my life until I realized it didn't. 
and 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 that's when the shift began to happen, which was much later in life. Are you an like, only child, or you have a sibling? I, I was the first one, and then oh. I have a younger sibling. And how is, how is that sibling? Uh, do they? Well, she she's very chilled out. So oh, it, it, it it's so funny that so I I was studying to become a doctorate, right? So I my only ambition in life was to get a PhD, go to NASA and work. I wanted oh. to become a space scientist, and find myself on Mars one day. And that, this was before Elon Musk has come into the picture. So. So none of this is polluted by startup culture or Bollywood culture or anything like that. And um, and then I went for my PhD in the US. I dropped out of it because I realized it didn't appeal to me anymore and I changed as a person. And my sister, who everyone thought would do nothing in life, <laughs> is now a tenured professor in Delhi University teaching. Oh, she did a bait and switch with <laughs> no, you. Totally. Like she was like, I just wait for to. uncle to flip. flip. And then I step just into his path. Yeah. And be like, nice. who's the better child now? But uh, you said that you had that phase of being very proper. Uh, was it a hard flip? Like, did you go all the way to the other side? No, or? no, no. I, I, I didn't. Yeah, I, I didn't yeah. like. Yeah, just this guy. It was, it was a gradual progression. I, I, I think the big, uh, the big shift was meeting my, uh, my then girlfriend and future wife, because she was. I was the man with the plan. Oh. I knew exactly what I wanted to do in life and I was methodical around that. And she was the one who was like, who makes plans? Like, why wow. do you need a plan? Because life is just so cool and you just embrace it. And she was this free flowing thing. Um, you now you can imagine, uh, what was that movie? Uh, Ranbir Kapoor ki, never mind. But no, he's this... Ranbir Kapoor, is it Rockstar? <laughs> no, not Rockstar. Elahi. What, what? What was that movie? The the song with Ilahi in it. Yeah, yes, oh. yeah, Jawani, Jawani, right? There's this free flowing dude, and it's like just welcome life with both arms and. So open. she was like that. She's completely like that. Got it. And um, and I, I've I've written content about this where I I would almost dismiss a person like that because I'd like yeah. no this person is not going to go anywhere yeah. without a plan. It's fun and all, but yeah. you need a plan. Exactly, you need <laughs> yeah. a plan. Yeah, and. And she surprised me because she just opened my eyes to a whole new world where you give serendipity a chance yeah. and, and you just commit yourself to being a certain person and then you just let life unfold for you and you're, you're magically taken to a world that you could not have predicted or planned for yourself, which is where I am right now. Wow. Because I couldn't have. But you know, I mean, when you say this, I still feel like uh, when I see how methodical and how, um, uh, you know, like organized your content is, and this, you have your third book. It all seems like there is still that proper planned side in, uh, of you. The, but you've, you've kind of come to, I guess, an equilibrium. I, I, I think the difference is I fixate myself on the inputs now and not the output. Okay. So I'm a, I'm a very boring person in the sense that I can, I can do the same thing every single day and not get tired of it. Okay. So I am very process driven. I'm very, very routine oriented. That's what works for me. So it's a superpower and I would make that use, but I don't care about where it takes me. So okay. I gave that fetish and fixation up long time back. Okay. And, and that's where I think life has taken me into multiple directions that I could not have planned for because there was, there was nothing that I was saying, oh, this was not what I expected. I was like, I didn't expect anything. So okay. when you don't expect anything, then anything is like a welcome thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, when, um, when I asked you, um, initially about uh, to be on the episode and um, I asked I wanted to ask you what are some questions that because uh, you also host you also have uh, I think it's a 30 minute series right yeah. so it's a very like a, a proper structured uh, thing which is, this is not unfortunately <laughs> uh, people ask can you put chapter markers I'm like there are no chapters <laughs> in this show how will I put chapter markers so we come up with chapter markers but um, and I asked you are there any questions that you wish uh you were asked back yeah. and uh, one of the um, one of the questions is what is your relationship with money mm. uh, growing up and um, yeah, as a child to now what what is the what is the difference huge man um, so we didn't grow up with money and okay. we we were perpetually in debt what my, did your uh, family <clears throat> so my my dad was in a sales and marketing role in the pharma industry my oh. mom was a primary school teacher in a local school I know one of them doesn't make money. <laughs> yes. Both. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, especially when you make, so the classic middle class way of escaping the, the money trap is 
you start buying more than you can afford okay. and you think that that is success and that is financial stability but it's nearly not because you know, you're borrowing money to feed that lifestyle and that's the classic mistake that my father also made a credit card debt personal loans and all of those things and and suddenly without a job without income with all those those debts on us it was it was a very very different life and i remember at that point hating money because oh. i felt that money was the sole reason for our family's problems yeah. and i was convinced that if we had money then we wouldn't have any problems which is by the way not true but i hated money so much that i never respected it so i always felt like if i could earn money and i had that confidence in myself that i can earn money whichever way i don't have to ever think about what to do with it and how to deal with it and whether to give it any respect so i was extremely dismissive over that and i never saved up i was flippant with it i i was everything that i wish i wasn't and and everything that i've said in the book and written in the book that i am trying to teach others now i was much later in life that i realized that money is extremely important not so much to buy things but to grant you your freedom yeah uh, freedom of no whether you want to work or not work or how much do you want to work on where do you want to stay and what do you want to eat and and how do you want to work out to look after yourself and all of those important choices in life and uh, if you don't respect money then money will never respect you as well damn it this is what damn. my dad keeps telling me yeah. <laughs> no what people but <laughs> yeah and True. Uh, yeah it's uh, it's interesting you say you hated money uh, i had a similar journey as well where Uh, dad was in the navy mom was a homemaker mm. and he joined uh, a private company and then we went from naval middle class so navy is kind of confusing where you they give you amenities so you feel very rich uh, like they really take care of you like yeah. we had a olympic size pool in our neighborhood we had a house and canteen gives you sure. groceries for 20 bucks yeah. but same day you don't get a salary yeah. as much and when he uh, left the navy and he got into a company and we went from like middle class to we had money and in 2 3 years my dad uh, entire division got laid off because one person on top was like we can do this entire project without this team and then we were like uh, poor rich mm. where my dad bought this big house in bangalore but he uh, he doesn't remember this but he brought us all together and said uh, we can't live the same lifestyle anymore mm. So he's sitting in this big house and for the past 3 years my dad's just buying me whatever I want. Now and that's when it stuck with me that oh uh, it can go away any day. Yeah. Uh how so, did you react to that? Yeah, I mean it's a, it's a sole reason I'm anywhere today because there's that unfortunate insecurity of money constantly mm. because I'm like it happened to my dad. He was absolutely yeah. fine with everything right. right. He's an IIT graduate, yeah. wonderful son, very smart naval commander. head of some uh, new company that he just joined and he lost all of it all of uh so then i realized oh so you kind of have to have a base sum mm. uh now that's the healthy realization yes. that i fully feel money is amazing <laughs> and uh, it really solves a lot of problems um uh, what is that thing that i would uh, rather cry in a mercedes no yeah exactly uh, i mean that's definitely there but i i i definitely have a number in my head I you did do. that Excel sheet, and yeah. I was like, "If I have this number, uh, just stop worrying about money." And then you mind sharing that number? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> What are we on? On some finance podcast? <laughs> like, uh, no, I'm dude. I'm South Indian, uh, Ankur. We don't God, like not my dear. So yeah, it, it's it's uh, it's it's one of the big reasons uh, I pursued money because in my head I was like, I can't uh, stress my dad out. He's always stressed. <laughs> uh, But yeah, and um, is it more than ten crores? It's not a. It's not that. I think it's a couple of things. It's like I need a roof over my head because mm. my dad had a loan for that big house. Mm. So I was like, I, I need to have a roof over my head. I need to have a retirement fund because my dad gets a pension. Sure. Uh, and I I know my yearly uh, cost, so I have at least five years of it. Uh, I know we'll always before. make some money for maintenance, right. but right. if I just get these things done, right. then you cover it. I can I can relax. So it, it was it was kind of that. But right. yeah, uh, money was a main focus because I like I, I I was in uh, I think eighth 
or mm. ninth and i'm like i don't want to yeah. i don't my kid to ever but I, i'm glad my dad kind of had that mature conversation with us and yeah. didn't protect us or something I, yeah. i'm glad he had that transparency and that vulnerability to uh <laughs> i'm glad like he told us because then we could kind of help him out yeah. um but yeah i don't want my kids to go through that if i have kids <laughs> someday you know uh because you know my wife is very similar when you were talking about your wife hmm. it's come from very holistic loving family <laughs> nice. and uh, money was never damn these well kept kids yeah it's yeah like, man screw up the defeatus it's a good combo <laughs> you have one child that's kind of had a lot of trauma one child that's loved a lot so you need the optimism of the love child to go through life the and realism. you need the realism <laughs> the pragmatism of the trauma child to be like yeah the world is not that yeah, dandy yeah, also exactly um so she has a very wonderful relation with money it's like it's money only it'll come it'll go and she's also very simple doesn't have any expensive taste so she's like we have all the money we ever need <laughs> what are you worried about i'm like you can all go away <laughs> yeah so but we love each other we have each other and that's also true you know like uh, when you meet somebody uh, who shows you she also taught me how to chill yeah she's like what is the point of all this If you don't know how to chill, I know. So I chill with her. Exactly. It's very nice. It's nice. That's yeah. nice. You found it. The next question are these questions that I have uh, formulated with my genius brain. Uh, okay. So what I really, as an outside perspective, you have a very clear cut, like crystal, like you know, I keep talking about personal branding with other comedians. A um, lot of artists struggle with. Seeing themselves as a brand, mm. and I, I don't, I, I don't think it's a bad thing to do. It just helps. the audience understand you better i have not seen a person who's done it as clearly as you like when i see any video you do the way you speak uh, the content of your videos the way you you've planned uh, everything around you it's um, it's super well planned and uh, crystal clear i'm not like hey does uncle do cooking <laughs> there's no <laughs> doubt okay uh, i wanted to ask you like you uh, unlike me we, we kind of stumbled into youtube we didn't mm-hmm. know what we were doing sure. you like i felt like did a research paper <laughs> on on content creation and all of this i just wanted to I was curious like when you got into youtube and when you finally blew up sorry i'm talking from the perspective when you blew up yeah it's it seemed very polished yeah i'm sure you had an experiment phase yeah could you just tell me the sure. process behind sure sure yeah so uh, so youtube started in 2017 and i i was a founder of a venture funded startup at that point of time and i started creating content which i would call very highbrow so today if i were to go to that content it was english with an accent okay. don't miss that it was all about startups and entrepreneurship it was very novel ravi kantish okay. and uh, very designed to come across as complex and me being perceived as very smart and intellectual and uh, the know it all and i did that for about 3 years clinically so again as i said i don't have any problems committing to a journey no sorry to interrupt you Please. but why won't get into that okay so that's a good question yeah. the reason i got into it was much earlier in 2013 itself and that was when i was running the startup i realized that to attract great talent you either had to go through these middlemen or these middle agencies which were recruiting sites oh. or press and media and blah blah or you could go direct and speak to the candidates that you wish to hire and we didn't like this route because as a venture funded company what gets spoken about you or written about you is the women fancy of what's the trend in that moment so if startups are the trend then everyone will be like oh we love you and we love nearby and we love everything but if it's not doing so well or if it's a <clears throat> down period then everyone will be like oh this startups losing money and it's going to the dogs blah blah and we said we have to take charge of our own narrative so in 2013 i started creating content on linkedin and on quora Oh, okay. Quora was this really fascinating destination. I don't know if you've ever spent time of there. Of course, eh. <laughs> it's like I don't know where, why Indians were hanging out at Quora. It's fun. Dude. It's just like uh, it was until it wasn't. So yeah. it's like now it's a mess. It, yeah. It's a mess. Yeah. I don't know what's happened to it. Yeah. I used to spend an inordinate amount of time on Quora, just answering questions. People used to ask me all kinds of questions, like what car does Ankur drive? I'm like, sure, this is the car. Mera kya jata? Now, how much does Ankur earn? Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, what's Ankur's love life? 
Yeah, sure. Where did he meet his wife? How much does an engineer in nearby earn? Any question and every, I have no problems in being transparent. I'm very authentic in my conduct. So I didn't have any challenge in just being who I was because that's what the audience wanted. And it blew up. I was at one point in the top 70 most followed people globally on Quora. Whoa. And I don't know how that happened. And we saw this massive influx of talent queries and interest coming in to so, the extent that my... So your um, uh, colleagues in the company were happy with this. They were like... They were, yeah, we're like... Because they were like, we're benefiting a lot. Because this was unheard of in that period. Absolutely. Like, like it was creating an employer brand. Exactly. Which was, which was something that Indians didn't spend time on as a, as a company at least. So my HR was like, no, we're... We, we're honestly irritated when we ask people, why do you want to join nearby? And they say, Ankur Variku, okay. because that's the wrong answer. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, no, that is the wrong answer. So please you know, take them with a Occupation pinch of salt. Occupational hazard, they just, they just like me too much. Yeah. <laughs> but it worked. Yeah. So we wanted to then extend that. And in 2017, funny incident, LinkedIn launched its video feature. Oh. LinkedIn until then was a complete text format. And uh, they announced that, hey, we've launched this video feature. And I was like, sure. So now it's going to come to people. And I waited patiently, patiently. And it was about three months. Nothing happened. And then one day I just wrote a post on LinkedIn saying, hey, Jeff, Jeff Wiener was the CEO of LinkedIn at that point. Hey, Jeff, what does one have to do to turn on the video feature on LinkedIn? And within an hour, I got a response from a product manager at LinkedIn saying, we've turned it on for you. Oh. I'm like, really? Nice. Like you... This is all that it took. Like I waited patiently and I thought there was some roadmap and some organized plan around this. And this is all that it took. I had to ask for it. And I was reminded of a principle that I live by in life, which is if you don't ask, the answer is always no. True. And it's always been true for me more than anything else. It happened to be a Wednesday and it happens to start with the letter W. My last name happens to start with the letter W. And I then shot a video Titled it Variku Wednesdays, oh. episode one, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. And the reason I said it's episode one is because I wanted to publicly commit to a journey without knowing what that journey would be. And it started on LinkedIn. Oh, amazing. So my first video didn't go on YouTube or on Instagram. It went on LinkedIn in 2017. Hence and, the, as you said, hi, bro. Like, yes. Because LinkedIn has that perception of... Yes, yeah. exactly. And then YouTube started because of that. So the core reason of content creation early on was to create an employer brand. It was not, not to create a personal brand. Okay. It was not to ride on, on who I was and as an individual. So when did that flip happen to... Now it's, it's a complete... It's uh, a complete In a good way. Brand. Yeah. It's a, it's a much more simplistic... Everybody should be able to understand this. Yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> Highbrow is a funny word. I heard it a lot during 2013. Yeah. When I suppose stand up, they used to be like, why are you posting such smart jokes? I'm like, it's not even smart. <laughs> it's just that I'm not assuming the audience is dumb. <laughs> yeah. It's too smart. Too jokes. Smart. I'm like, yeah. you're really, uh, your standard for smart is very low. <laughs> it's true. Like everybody had various terms, like EA nature on YouTube. Mein. Uh. But sorry. And so, so when did that uh, optimization happen? That shift happened, Kenny, in... Uh, early 2020. And the reason was, so I stepped down as the CEO of my startup in 2019, end of 2019. And I was figuring what next to do in life. And this was one of the things that I already had activated, not for the core reason, but I said, you know what, I don't know what could come out of it. Let's just see. So I built a small team and I said, let's double down on this content and, and see where it takes. And from March 2020 till about October 2020 was that experimentation phase that you oh. were referring to, where we on YouTube dabbled with literally everything. Okay. I was still that highbrow. I was also dabbling with Hindi, with English, with personal finance, with book reviews, with self-improvement, things that I knew of, spoke about, felt passionately towards, not knowing which one of them would fly. And I think it was, again, serendipity, right place, right time, that that was the time when everyone had time on their hands. The market surprisingly were performing far better than everyone expected it to because people thought that the world was getting over during COVID. Yeah. But markets somehow were living in a different world. So it just rode that way where personal finance which certainly became, at least on YouTube, became the, the dominant category. You know, were you seeing all of this? 
Uh, but a lot of other people have attempted this. But there's an inherent <coughs> finesse and clarity. Like even right now, like even when you walked into the door, there's a, there is a, there is no wastage of words, you know. That where did that come from? Like it's it's a you're like an editor's dream basically. Like I only know which parts. My editor doesn't have to do anything. He only said six things I've learned. Like I don't even uh, these chapters for this ch- <laughs> are going to be very easy, easiest. Like where do you? I know. Th- is there is there some part of your brain where you're like I need to make sure I'm saying this the most effective way I can, or this is a learned thing? Or I think it's just training, and it's also the fact that I'm 44, which a lot of people just dismiss because there's a lot you know, of years. Like, of- I like for example, people ask me, "Hey, how do you deal with trolling?" I'm like, "Dude, I'm 44. <laughs> I don't need to deal with trolling. I'm dealt with fucking life." I, I, I've, I've gone through hajar so cheese. I've laid off people. I've had my startup run out of money. I've raised <laughs> funds. Do you think that some random you, strangers, BC, MC is going to affect my life? Can you please name your next book, Dude, I'm 44. I, I like, yeah, yeah, I do it at 44. It's a great answer. Dude. Right. Because That's if true. I was 24, it answers everything. Yeah. I, I would be a very different person and I would just be suffering from FOMO that everyone in the 20s, for, for no fault of theirs, seems to. Because I also did. Like, I have lived yeah, being yeah, 20. Right. You know, it seems like I was born 40, but you know, I've, I've gone through that 20. It was <laughs> no, just a very really long time back. Yeah. So, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. that I, it's, it's a. No, but I, I think like you're kind of understating uh, how. I. How. I would say it's almost like, you know, the only word I can think of is aerodynamic. There's no drag at all. Um, and, you know, I, and, I, and I follow you. I subscribe to your YouTube channel. Thank you. And every time I, you do a new video, in, even if it's a topic you have done before, there's always something new and there's something. So it's really uh, impressive how um, you you think you're going to stop watching, but you don't. You're like, it's it's a... And I've seen your style change as well. I think in the beginning, as you said, it was more to the point. Now we become like, yeah. let me uh, leak in my personality into yes, this video. Exactly. Let me put a joke. Exactly. Let me put a stutter in there. Yeah. So it's very nice. Um, Thank you. So actually, I had a different uh, variation of the third question you had mm, asked please. yourself, which was, is there any particular story or experience uh, that isn't related to business or content creation, sure. uh, but shaped how you do things in life and not from a success point of view just as a living point of view where i mean it's one big answer is you're 44 <laughs> but is there a story or something that kind of had a paradigm shift in how you looked at everything one 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 story that comes to my mind so this is my my first job out of business school and i there was one subject that i absolutely hated accounting i didn't for the love of me understand why the world needs accounting or accountants and I felt that they just created their own need and they just dumped the subject on us, which I think is true for most people. But <laughs> as luck would have it, my first project that I get out of, I'm, I'm in a consulting job. So you move around projects. And the first one that I get is this really intense real estate company that's setting up a new project and wants the balance sheet and the PL and the cash flow statement for the next five years for this project. And I'm like, Right. So now I got to do this and I suck at it. I get backed into my books and I'm reading it, but I clearly know that I'm not doing a good job of it. And my impression, Kenny, of what a manager's role at that point is that the job of me is to do my work to the best of my ability. And then the manager's job is to correct my work, to figure out what the mistakes are, point them to me and then tell me to correct them and I will correct them. And that's the symbiotic relationship we have. So I figured, great. And I sent my work and my manager was like, hey, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, correct it. And I corrected it and I felt really good about myself that I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to do and he is also doing what he's supposed to do. And this goes on for about a month or so and at one point in time he clearly gives up and he's he comes on a call and he's like, uncle, there are still some errors in the work that you've done. And you have to recognize That if I can't trust you, it doesn't matter how smart you are. And that just hit. Because I don't know what world I was living in until then. But now I realize that what I was essentially doing was bringing him down to my level where he has to do my work. And even if my work is flawless, he doesn't trust that. 
So he still has to go through my work to figure that it is clear and perfect. But that's not the best use of his time. So more than me being smart or hardworking or committed or driven and blah, 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 I just need to get to a point where he trusts me. And trust became a very, very important playbook of my life. So when trust is established, what happens? So it's a very interesting phenomenon based on the culture that you're based in. So India, for example, is, in my opinion, a trust deficient country. We don't trust people easily. Growing up, we're told, dal mein kuch kala hai. There's something fishy. The person is being too nice and too smart. You there's just a want to make money. Yeah, exactly. Right? There's a scheme. There's something out there. Yeah. So you'll be on your guard and you'll all pretend that you're smart and <clears throat> attentive. But what happens in a trust deficient culture is that if you start with trust, which is not what people are expecting you to do, they lose their shit. <laughs> they just lose their shit. Okay. So here's an example. Everyone in my company gets paid at the start of the month and not at the end of the month. Because I never figured why people get paid at the end of the month. Okay. So imagine, and this happened recently, someone joined on the 1st of April. And the day she joined, she got her salary for April. And this essentially says, I trust you. Hmm. I trust you to not run away. I trust you to do your work for the rest of the month. I trust you to be the person that I expect you to be. And when people don't expect that and they're not used to it in their normal life, the well-intentioned ones go out of their way to do even more than what they would have done otherwise. Because they just feel completely overwhelmed with that level of trust that's been in there. Yeah. That's the superpower in a trust-efficient economy. If you are, of course, in a trust excess, which is, say, a US, whether you trust people or you trust the systems or you trust processes, blah, blah, this blah. This is a baseline trust. You there do is, your job. You just, yeah, you yeah. just do your job, right? So yeah. people just trust you. Yeah. Uh, it's like the train will show up on time. Yeah. There, there's no surprise if it doesn't or if it does. So I feel that it's a superpower in, in, a, in a country where there's this trust efficiency. And this is why when I ask people, hey, what's the most trusted brand in the country? And people are like, Tata. Oh, that's great. Do you know how that works in our head? Because in our head, we trust that brand so much that we are ready to buy Namak from Tata, mm. cars from Tata, hotels from Tata, airlines from Tata, steel from Tata, schooling and education from Tata, chemicals from Tata. Like they have no business being in all of these businesses. They clearly can't be the expert in all of this. But the reason why they even chose to do so and have this conglomerate view is because trust adds superpowers to your selling abilities in a trust-efficient economy. And, and that's why you would see a lot more of these enterprises in cultures such as ours than in the West. Like in mm. the West, name a conglomerate. After GE, people will be unable to. Mm. They don't know. They're vertically specialized players. Mm. Because people ask, hey, you, you're making these super awesome electric vehicles. Do you have the expertise to do so? Mm. Oh, if the answer is yes, that's the only reason I'll consider you. Otherwise, you have no business being there, bro. Like, there are better players. It's interesting because I had this realization about trust in relationships, like in my <laughs> my dating life. And uh, the outcome of that <laughs> was, um, I think when the, I was so busy trying to establish baseline trust and I'm not blaming anybody. I think you know, I'm, I, I had issues. Uh, but when you finally get that baseline trust of like, Again, I'm just giving examples like, oh, you won't cheat on me. Mm. You will have a steady emotional state every day, <laughs> which is yes. a blessing yes. <laughs> for both parties. And if I communicate a need that will be heard and listened to and um, uh, our priorities, which we share with each other, are going to be respected consistently and uh, we won't take each other for the, the baseline. Then I realize then you can truly experience the fruits of relationships, True. which is like, Hey, should we start a family together? Should we invest in a house together? Should we, um, yeah, like uh, now that our life is good, help other people in our uh, social circle to improve their lives. You don't even get to reach this awesome place because you're so busy figuring out baseline. Like, yeah. can I just not fight with you today? Yeah. Uh, can I just um, not have to prove myself to you today? True. Uh, so, yeah, I'm also very lucky. I have a very good team. In, in terms of work and uh, uh, for, for me I think it was it, because I'm an artist 
to be honest trust is all that i care about yeah uh because it's such an emotional job as well yeah. like there's no boundaries yeah. like there's no office when you're doing stand up uh so i'm like you you're probably going to know <laughs> i mean my manager is right here i had a bad breakup <laughs> and i was not in good shape and uh, <laughs> he was just like this one more show man <laughs> this one more show got i know and then uh, he just tried to keep me away from stage as long as i could yeah um and i think that it's so nice that if i tell them that i i never even expect them to use it against me yeah uh but it has been used against me where i think i was doing a project in years ago and i <laughs> another breakup you can see a pattern here and uh, they were not bothered they were just like do your job and yeah. i was just like uh, just because i had a breakup and i was like what the hell man i told you that in confidence <laughs> Uh so yeah I think uh, trust especially for me is um, I don't mean that in a bad way you could be okay at what you do but yeah. if I can completely trust you it actually creates greater work absolutely because you're not like going back to that level and checking accounts and checking you just know like oh, that so obviously you have sorted it let's think about greater things correct uh, oh that is very cool um in in a relationship you, know, you, you mentioned this the the worst thing that you can do is to keep testing trust yeah it's like you know, sending that text him like let's see whether she replies or not <laughs> like what yeah like, let's see if she remembers our anniversary or not yeah it's usually he but not she but yeah you know, get the point yeah. right? that's testing trust yeah don't trust us because yeah. if you test trust you don't trust simple like yeah. even if you were to have that person pass the test you would still keep doubting because you're in that mode where you're testing True. it so i guess it's just broken trust is either it's broken just broken or exactly. just assume it's there yeah you just assume it's there uh you come into your house there with another person trust is broken yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so also a, a big part of the show is uh, we have questions from the audience and um so th- they send these questions on our instagram page uh-huh. uh through dms because a uh, lot of times you know it's so funny i love how sweet and honest the audiences they'll send a lot of questions like my family cannot know about this no, no, <laughs> don't no, mention no. my name no mention so whenever they say don't mention my name i feel like this is like a truly genuine question um so this is from a person and uh, she says um, sometimes doing something fun seems meaningless until you have achieved something great in life and i have been doing that postponing all fun things and thinking i would do those after i get this particular job but what if i never get that job does that mean me undeserving of all the fun things i mean i would obviously face financial difficulties eventually so maybe i should just keep focusing on getting the job and working hard but honestly i'm tired of being sad and want to feel happy but i know i won't until i get the job it's a deadlock so this is like i also have this like a uh, i will uh, hustle 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 level not enjoy life for what if the hustle never pays off then like i'm not allowed to have fun only yeah, then yeah exactly so um how can you help this uh, the <laughs> so conflict let me let me try and answer this with an example here let's assume that on the 1st of jan when uh, 90% of the world vows to get fit i give you all a gym membership for free because i'm this really kind person but this gym is a very peculiar gym it doesn't have any mirrors so you can't see yourself oh it doesn't have any measuring tape or any weighing scale so you can't weigh yourself you can't measure yourself and the best thing about the gym which i love is that there is nobody at the gym when you are working out nobody you just by yourself and my question to you would be if you were to go to that gym and even if you are getting fitter how long do you think you would go to such a gym and the answer would be no more than 2 weeks because mm. it's just a uh, you wouldn't know why but here's the reason why the reason why people would hate to go to such a gym is because there's no sense of progress there's zero sense of progress you can't see yourself getting fitter you can't weigh yourself getting fitter you don't have anyone saying hey can you look fitter there's nothing that's coming in as a feedback to tell you that all this hard work is amounting to something not an eventual goal but just a sense of progress and this came from an insight that humans don't experience as much joy when they hit a goal as they do when they realize they are progressing towards hitting the goal i'll say this once more 
we don't experience as much joy in hitting a goal as we do in experiencing a sense of progress towards hitting a goal. And the worst mistake that we all tend to make is to attach all of our happiness towards the end outcome. Almost making it feel like the path to that is drab, it's dry, it's painful. Mm. But that's precisely what we have to feel joyful about. And feeling is not just something you can turn on. You have to actively sit down with yourself and say, hey, forget the big arena that I want to sell out for that evening when I do my magnum opus. How does the journey of writing that content for that evening become joyful for me? Yeah. What can I do to make that piece joyful? Because if I do that actively well, of course I'll feel joy when that evening happens. But every single day that I feel that sense of progress, I will feel good about myself. I'll actually feel great about myself. Yeah. That's the key. That's very cool that the gym example was such a great analogy. Uh, I never realized that myself, like, I actually do the opposite. I'm like, I'm not allowed to celebrate till it happens. So don't get too excited. But uh, the mini celebration of progress. And also it seems like a show to keep track. Yeah. Um, I think like I've been doing YouTube for a while. And now YouTube is almost like a fun thing I just do. And um, I always thought that my YouTube now is not doing as well as before. Because I was like, uh, I don't post as much and I'm touring and I have stuff on OTTs now. So it's not. Then I, we had to do like a hygiene check of the. We had to give stats to some mm. brand wanted it. And they wanted like a yearly stat and they only made a graph. And they told me that my YouTube channel has been doing the best it's ever have. And I was like, oh, and like from last year, this has been like a 30% jump. And I was like, I really need to start <laughs> measuring more. Because yeah. I really thought this is like... Uh, not even worth looking at anymore but uh, it's in incredible as you said that measuring even my trainer uh, keeps telling me measure yes. your waist measure your thing yes. you kind of take it for granted because you look in the mirror you're like oh, I don't Kuch look very you. nice today <laughs> that's so true um, and I didn't know we were so attached to being updated about the progress yeah because yeah, yeah there's, there's only one thing to look forward to and when you reach there obviously you look forward to the next next, next thing the next thing is like that's a really cool analogy and i hope that helped you person on screen who asked this question um okay so this question i know you're going to say you're 44 but this question is from aditi sure. this is directed at us okay that um there's a fine line between being confident and arrogant mm -hmm. and being humble and underestimating yourself and since i don't want to cross that line and end up on the arrogant side i often end up underestimating myself mm. Uh, as someone who's in the public eye and one of the key components of being in the spotlight is being confident, how do you manage to keep up your self-esteem and not cross the fine lines? I thought it was very cool. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Because it is a subjective line. Uh, for me, the answer is very clear. I, I, I believe confidence is your ability to process something objectively without being attached to your own opinion. Oh. So... If in this conversation, Kenny's like, no, I, I have a different point of view. Here's the reason why I have this point of view. What do you think about it? And I'll think about it as like, now, you know what? It makes sense. I think you're right. Hmm. Or at least it's worthy of giving it a shot or a thought. And when you do that with no ego attached, with no sense of insecurity and no feeling of embarrassment that you have been quote unquote proven wrong, it ironically comes across as confidence. Confidence is not that I know all the answers. It's that I know enough about me to always seek out the truth and be married to that truth. And arrogance is when it very easily becomes, dude, you can't be possibly right because mm. you know I'm always right. I, no, this is, I don't want to even hear you out. I, I know I'm right. <laughs> like you look at me. And underconfidence is like, yeah, you're always right. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm dumb. I'm, I'm stupid. You, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, you're always right. And neither of these two are helping because mm -hmm. they're essentially either blocking all channels of learning or bringing in all possible shit, including noise. What you ought to do is have the ability to at least 
hear noise and be like, hey, this could be a signal. And let me just absorb that and see it on myself. And I trust my capability and my agency to, to make sense of it. That's yeah. confidence. That's how a top 70 quota <coughs> celebrity answer. That is such a perfect answer. I really liked what you said, uh, that confidence is uh, having an objective uh, perspective on things without your ego. Yeah. Uh, that's really cool I never saw it that, that way I kind of just saw that as confident as somebody who's just like <laughs> even if they're wrong they're like it's cool yeah. Uh, yeah. but it's also, it's also true that you can process things very objectively you can process yeah but it is I mean you are saying objectively but ob- someone's objectivity is also very subjective it is also subjective uh, like um, um, something I've heard on the great points is like the entrepreneur who said this I saw a clip you might know who said this, but basically that in India, if you're an entrepreneur, humility is more encouraged hmm. than being lavish. Um, like Narayan Moti's approach. Yeah, of, yeah. Um, Hashtag Tata versus money. Yeah. So like, uh, is that something you struggle with? Because as you said, if you asked me how much money is that figure and I'm very scared of talking of course in South India that's a big no no dude in South India you have to appear as poor as you yeah, can yeah I know exactly yes, um, but yeah so <laughs> is, is that something you struggle with like again your answer was pitch perfect and yeah. beautifully like if I have to transcribe it I can put it on the, in a book <laughs> which will come to in the next version <laughs> is that something you do you stress about that at all or no I, I no, no I don't because for me, it's very clear, Kenny, that a personal brand is not about the right or the wrong personal brand. For example, you have enough and more cases where people will be like, what kind of people are this generation following? Why are they following this loser? Why are they following this show off person? Blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. What people care about is consistency and authenticity. Are you consistently doing something because... You're authentically that person. Hmm. Now, that could be somebody who just lives their life in Mercedes and BMWs and Apples and Mm. Louis Vuittons and sneakers and all of those. And lo and behold, there will always be an audience that will follow that person because they're consistently and authentically that person. So depending on where you are in what phase of life, you'll be like, no, that appeals to me. Hmm. That's that's exactly who I want to be. That's what I'm drawn towards. And then on the other side, there'd be someone who's like, you know what, he's, he's never showing off. Mm-hmm. And he's never pretending as if he has more money than he really does. And no, he's, even if he's clicking a photograph in an airplane, you can never make out whether it's economy or business class. Uh, um, I'm not pointing to anything. Just, so, just like, zoom into your face. So you can't like, see the yeah, cushions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? Like there's, there's no yeah. air in the orange. Nothing. So yeah. the, that, uh, and, and if they do consistently that, and authentically so, then there will always be an appeal to that. When you're living in a country of 1.4 billion people, irrespective of what you do, if you do it consistently, you will always have an audience for it. Always. Which is why shit also has an audience in this country. Hmm. And in equal measure, class and intellect and whatnot. Any filter, 1.4 billion will always have a mass. Like I, I was telling this to somebody, there are 450 million people who visit YouTube every month from India. Oh. 450 million people. Where are the views, man? <laughs> that's why, right? So even if you Damn were to it. attract 1% of that, yeah. that's 4.5 million people. How many people Same. in this country have 4.5 million followers? I, yeah. So it's, like, it's just 1% of the entire population that comes through. So even if you were to make shit, you'll be attracting 1%. Like that's it's yeah. easy. Can we use that to make people who are watching and not subscribe, <laughs> subscribe? This is the moment. But that's a great point. Like, uh, yeah, I think you're right. It's not the message they're giving out. It's the inconsistency of it. That today you said this, tomorrow, exactly. that's, that's more pissing off, I would agree. That is and if you just pissing. disagree with them. Yes. That's okay. But exactly. It's like yesterday only you were saying. Um, I just want to let everyone know that I'm lying to you through my teeth. I'm not telling you how much money I make and I never will. <laughs> Okay, I pay my taxes. That's all I'm supposed to do. Uh, now, let's come to a big uh, uh, a big event. You have released a brand new book. Yes. And this is the third book of yes. a series, of epic series. Epic series. Um, so, it's uh, your first book was Do Epic Shit. And then second book was Get Epic Shit Done. And now we have Make Epic Money. Yeah. Now, again, Ankur Variku's optimization engine. Three words. 
Uh, epic is there in all three books. Can't get confused. I can look at it. That's an Ankur Varaki book. Very impressed. Uh, I've uh, unfortunately not had the opportunity to read it. I was in Goa for Easter. Y- you're you're and you're uh, close to getting to that number already. So it's like uh, to what number? <laughs> I don't talk numbers, bro. <laughs> The number has been shared with me. It just hasn't gone public. Never. I don't even know how to use Excel. So Ankur only reads Excel. We all know that. Um, but yeah. So uh, before you get to your third book, can you? Uh, actually, don't check the book because it's disrespectful in our culture. Uh, thank you, Vivian. Uh, keep the book here. It's very cool, and it has the same design language as your other books yeah, as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know why I did this. I should. I just put it down. Okay. So before you get to this book. Was it a roadmap for these three, or you went with the first book and you're like, I like where this is going? Yeah, that, that's exactly how it happened. I, I went with the first book with the plan of only having a first book, and then my publisher at that point was like, uh, "Hey, when's the next book coming?" And I was like, "What? Yeah. Next book? We never Classic about it. publisher. Yeah, exactly. I was just like, "Well, how many videos do you release on YouTube every week?" And I'm like three. I'm like, okay, how, how many reels do you produce every every week? And I was like seven. Like, so you don't think you should be writing a book a year? A book a year. So a book a year. A book a year is my commitment. And uh, that's the process that I've set myself on. Jesus, a book a year? A book a year. Damn. So so it's been three years and three books. And the next two books are lined up already. Really it's lined up? No, in the sense not written. But I know what they will be on. So you're currently writing, it's, we're yes. only in uh, April, <laughs> I hope yeah, I know, like, it's like, it's like If you don't mind me like, sharing, do you have a, uh, what is your uh, schedule for this? It's, it's, it's a crazy schedule. Okay. No, so, so uh, the book gets released every Jan. Okay. And it's written in the month of May, June and July, edited in the month of August and September. And then uh, final works happen in October before it goes into print. And that's like the clockwork. Wow. Yeah. And what is the... Um, so the the first was do epic shit. Yes. Uh, that is more of a philosophy. That was just, yeah, that was yeah. just my thoughts compiled. Hmm. And then get epic shit done was the top 36 questions that people often ask me. Anything under the sun, my responses to those. So that became like a answer key to life. And then I have money followed by career, followed by relationships. Oh. Which will then make it into a five book series that I hope that every 20 year old could be like gifted on their 20th birthday. It's like, hey, here are the five books that will take care of you this decade. Very cool. So that's like the overarching that's like season the overarching arc. Like, yes, that's like the season finale. Amazing. And, and uh, what are the types of books you do, like you like consuming? It's uh, 100% nonfiction. Okay. But there's no specific genre within that. So I love history, I love self help. I love business. I love autobiographies, uh, but anything that flows. I'm I'm consuming spirituality a lot right now, um, and I usually read just one book a time. I I don't. I haven't yet got to reading two books or three books. You're at not poly with books. <laughs> Monogamy. <laughs> with books, yeah, just yeah. just very very committed at that point. At one time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I, I really love reading books and it, that's a daily affair. So like when you approach uh, the subject for the book, I mean, you've laid it out, but um, there's so much, uh, don't you get like fatigue about like talking about so many things? Like how do you bifurcate? Like, is there like, oh, for a book, I think this is the right approach for a video. This is the right approach for a reel. Cause these are all uh, topics that I have very um, common Venn diagrams. Yeah. How do you like, you know, like, no, no, this is for the book. I can't do this on video. Like what, what aspect of the book writing process you? So the, the book is written with a very clear reader in mind and it's somebody who doesn't read. Oh, so I'm not writing this for readers. In fact, all of my three books will be very disconcerting for an active reader because they don't follow any structure. It's, it's Mm. almost like challenging the set notion of what a book should be. Uh, Do Epic Shit really ruffled a lot of feathers because there's no rhythm. Every page was just by itself. You could be reading about something. The next page could be about something completely different. It was, think of it like a compilation of tweets Mm -hmm. uh, randomly thrown in. Got it. And what it does is it appeals to a generation that doesn't read as much. They have the attention span of a goldfish. But they like that. (laughs) They're proud of it yeah. because they want to be very quickly consuming something and still seem knowledgeable about that. They love their books to be Instagrammable. 
they want to feel a sense of pride in reading a book but not be committed to finishing a book fair and the book ought to then give them that flexibility and almost that leeway and freedom that you know what even if you were to drop the book at any point you'll still have something that you would have taken away because there's no story attached to it there's no rhythm to this book so when you just that last point so how do you achieve that so you in your one page you have to be like if this is the only page they read so it, it it's not always in one page but it's like in it's a few chapter yes yeah. so this chapter will be like in this book the chapter is at best like 5 7 pages so you're like if they just get this chapter they will still get something out of it that's it that's it in just that like and every chapter is independent there's no interlinkage it doesn't assume that you've already read the previous chapter so you can go like to the middle of the book the middle of the book start from there and you'll still know exactly what you need to do or okay. need to learn but do you have um, again you had an interesting point before about generations and i just had to ask you <laughs> please now you 44 uh, i'm sure you interact with a lot of i'm 33 So I don't know how annoying you find me, but do you do you meet? Because there are some insanely brilliant creators who are like children. Uh, what 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 have you observed with uh, generations in India specific, at least? I, I I don't think it's a geographical distinction at all. But yeah. every every youngster and and I qualify youngsters as uh, people in their 20s but oh. everyone else is also no so you're you're clearly old I'm old um yeah. you almost there retirement planning yeah, I'm yeah. glad you mentioned yeah because yeah. that those no, would seriously. not those would not be words uttered by any 20 year old like they'd be like dude as 25 i want to stop working <laughs> I was like, there's a way out of this right there has to be yeah. someone give me that way yeah. the uh, the big distinction and and you would have seen that crossover i certainly felt it on just one side when we were growing up 1980s 1990s india we had no choice but to wait for everything hmm. everything was a wait so you wanted to watch your favorite hindi movie songs well yeah wednesday 7 pm chitra ha that's the only slot and if lo and behold there was no electricity that day yeah next week because there was nothing and you had to wait for your favorite whatever movie tv schedule you have to wait for a car you have to wait for a phone you have to wait for everything and then this generation which doesn't have to wait for anything everything is on demand like you movie click cab click food click love swipe right like everything on demand yeah so it tricks them into believing that everything in life can happen on demand mm. and that when coupled with social media which is a massive validating platform it numbs them into feeling that if i am not getting to a million followers in x time there must be something wrong with me because this ought to come on demand it's almost by will and and that's why you no know, i'll have these conversations with 21 year olds and they're like um hey how's your job going and i know uh, not so well uncle you what's wrong i'm not creating any impact I like how, how long have you been working bro? I'm like 6 months. Like who the fuck told you that you have to create impact in 6 months? There were people who have been at this job for 60 years and they haven't created any impact. Oof. But they're like they believe that their job is to come and on demand shake the world up because that's the world they were born in. So they haven't seen anything else. So just to try make this tangible, if somebody has a goal uh for example to be a content creator or to start a company or make an impact what is like the period of time uh where where you shouldn't be hard on yourself is it 5 years 10 years 15 years there should not be any time stamp to your life goals okay that's just track the progress just track the progress be at it and very often ironically if you don't put a time stamp to your goal you're likely to get it sooner yeah because you're just then a student of the journey not of the end outcome and you tend to then experience a lot more progress than if you were to just fret about the outcome and be painful about the fact that it's not coming any sooner do you think the the delayed gratification is a generational thing or a culture thing or a person thing i i i think it's a it's interesting you asked this i'll flip the question a little bit my wife and i we were having this conversation the other day and we were like our kids are aged 12 and 
both my wife and I, we worked intensely hard for the first 40 years of our life. And we now have this beautiful life, which we ourselves envy in many ways, and we're supremely blessed to get. And we were sitting and thinking, hey, what does that mean for our kids? Yeah. So Vidur, our 12 year old, he saw a little bit of our hard journey, say about three years. Let's assume that by five is when they start to interpret things. Our daughter, Uzma, was six. She's seen shit, like nothing. So if I were to ask you, hey, Uzma, what do you think a successful life means? She'd be like, oh, you work from home and then yeah. you just go down and you shoot some videos and yeah. life's cool, bro. True. That's exactly what hard work for her is. Her definition of hard work is me sitting on my emails for half an hour a day. She has not seen the grind. She has no idea what that grind is. And then they go to a great school. It's all bloody air conditioned and blah, 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 blah. So there's no sweat in their life. There's no sense of what is physical labor. She won't even read your books because she's like, you can just tell me. Yeah, exactly. Dad, right? you can just tell they, me they, what's there. They're like summaries of this stuff. Yeah. Like, or, or I just hear this, like I'm, I'm yeah. <laughs> so over you. But will this be something that we are okay with or not? And at least my stand, she had a different stand from me. My stand was that progressively every generation does not have to work as hard as the previous one. It's just by design. We didn't work as hard as our parents did. And our kids will not have to work as hard as we did. And that should be okay. As long as we set them up for dealing with adversity. That's the only thing you're optimizing for. That they should know how to deal with a setback and not lose their shit. Hmm. But beyond that, they wouldn't have to work as hard as we did to get to the same point or even beyond that. And by that same measure, if there is a generation that is being raised with a yes, okay. sense of ambition and audacity that we find is uh, too impatient, you know what? They'll actually benefit from that hmm. because they will be able to get to a point where they'll retire by 40 and they won't have to work till 60 because the world's changed and opportunities are low and behold and they have far more at their disposal to make that thing work for them. So don't be dismissive just because you had that the only way of living life. They need it. The world's changed. Or you could create artificial scarcity and pretend like you're poor and don't give your kids anything. And then when they're eating, be like, hey, psych, you can go to any college you want. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, because you know, this is honestly something I see. <laughs> like the con- classic parent yeah, move yeah. I tell like, Tracy all the time like um, we can't be this comfortable when we have kids she's like what do you mean like uh, like sometimes when I have like a work gig or something they give us like business class tickets so uh, then I'll get Tracy one um, I have just revealed I spent money but anyway I'm like if we have kids we are not going in even economic economic premium she's like why <laughs> dude you can't have a kid's first memories be in a plane getting a gourmet meal it has to be like I remember being in a train and uh, and you know like pining for the guy to walk by and then you have to get his attention yeah. and then he gives you food and then he might not have what you want and uh, that's a beautiful thing and um, uh, I do feel like there's a point at which that's too comfortable it's not good for you and as you said, you've rightfully reached this point. But um, so my, um, there's a family member, I won't mention who. So no, please do. The, so <laughs> she's like a younger one. And uh, when uh, the siblings were much younger, they, they had a scooter. So both used to sit in a scooter, parents used to sit in a scooter. Now they have four cars. And uh, I caught her saying that we're going out to the mall or something. And, and she was like, which car are we using? And then they were like this one. She's like, great, because I... Hit the other guys. <laughs> <laughs> and this is from somebody who just a few years ago they had a scooter. And I was like, there's nothing, there's no silver lining to this at all. Oh, it's just, there's less struggle. What is this? A car is a car, you know. In the future, it might be flying, but it's still a car. So, uh, artificial scarcity is the solution, I feel. Uh, just hide <laughs> hide your money from the kids mm-hmm. and when you feel like they have good character and they appreciate money then you're just, like here you go just, yeah. yeah when you're 18 Shard and your brain can like, fathom it uh, totally uh, don't yeah, deprive yeah, yeah. them of opportunities we just won a lottery yeah we just won yeah, a lottery exactly. 
Hey, your mom just remember her net banking password. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Just like, you no, know, all those shares we hadn't demat. Like, you no, know, we, yeah. we we just did, and no. Uh, OTP we found <laughs> that 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 MRF. Have you seen that MRF video? Some guy. Amar he calls up and says he has like my my dada ji just bought some insane number of shares and no I don't know what to do with it and, and he like, said some ten thousand and the calculation ke hisab se no you were like hundred and sixty crores or something oh. and then he cuts a call no randomly. and then he's like okay done I'm, I'm Mr Sharma <laughs> like, Mr Sharma is just cut he's like oh sure I want because <laughs> Mr Sharma clearly has a job now to do like he he can't be yeah. like, no yeah I'm not joking by the way I really feel <laughs> it's Kenny Sebastian the parent. Ah uh, yes. Okay, I think that's a great point to uh, end the show. Thank you so much, Uncle, for coming. Thank on, you, Kenny, on the show, and we spoke some stuff. And I'm very happy we have chapter markers uh, <laughs> for the show. And uh, also, please uh, see, <laughs> he's already sold hundred and fifty thousand copies. So just do it and buy one more <laughs> copy. Might as well instead of uh, getting four more. Thank you so much for coming, Uncle. It was an awesome conversation. It's, it's great to know. uh this side of you as well uh, thank you kelly and uh, really amazing succinct answers to everything and uh thank you uh, my editor is saying thank you to you uh <laughs> and and if you want to listen to this podcast in the audio version you can on all podcasting platforms except doordarshan uh cuz we've said little dirty things did we say any i don't think we said the f word today right I did. I did. I did. We said, "Oh, then I we did. can't I be did. on the other." Damn it! Yeah, sorry. Uh, but all other platforms is there, and uh, your your questions are very important to us. You can ask it on the Instagram or on the YouTube comments with hashtag Simple Game. And um, again, uh, please give a warm welcome to Uncle into this universe of Simple Game. Uh, it's nice to meet somebody and have such a um, uh, in depth and layered conversation. uh and please tell us what part you liked and if there are any more questions we'll call you back uncle i guess i have to call you every year now because you're going to have a book every year yeah. and um sign up for it yeah and you know what i also talk about finance <laughs> it's about time south indian finance <laughs> how to gently tell your relatives so much money so like. it says exactly like this this range yeah yeah you you work in ranges i think there should be a excel South India version, yeah, which doesn't work on specific number but ranges. Yeah, could be ten thousand, could be ten crores, crores. Yeah. Uh, anywhere in between, and you just sum these things up. This is formula, correct? Correct. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think that will be awesome. Thank you so much. Ta-da! Bye bye.